I'm really going for a picturesque workshop on the inside and out. And the staple of the outside are these barn doors. So let me show you how I built them. There are a lot of aspects to making sure that these barn doors are just right. This is a pretty lengthy video. I know. I get it. Here's a list of timestamps for the different sections of this build. So if you're only interested in one or a few aspects, you can skip around to what you want to watch. Or if you want to watch the entire thing, you're a rock star. Right? Right? Okay, you can go down. Okay, very quickly, the different sections are sketching the design, hanging the track, building a track cover or dormer, I guess it could be called either, building the doors, painting them, attaching the hardware, hanging the doors, <laughs> boy that was tricky, and some finishing touches, which includes the locking hardware and the weather sealing. Okay, ready, set, go! Before making a to scale drawing, I started with a general sketch to make sure I'm including everything. This is a side view of the system. The right side is the existing siding and header beam on the face of the building. When researching materials for the flashing, the only readily available piece that would work for this situation was a 110 degree flashing that had to be trimmed a bit. That dictated the angle of the overhang to be at 20 degrees, so all my cuts for this will be at 20 degrees. The 110 flashing will tuck under the existing flashing and lay on a top piece above the track. I sketched in an L bracket to go above only the doorway, but I'll wait till it rains to see if that's even needed. Connected to the top will be a front face piece. This design will prevent any water from going up and over the top of the door, keeping the inside of the workshop dry. The top piece needs some support, so I'll add a 2x4 supporting rail above the track. I first did a quick sketch to make sure I had everything included, then flipped the page to make a drawing to scale. I used a ruler and protractor to get the measurements and angles just right. I used a bracket and trolley to outline their pieces accurately. This is why sketching it out ahead of time is important. I needed to adjust the location of the support rail because of the bolt that connects the bracket to the wall. Another important step of the design is the width measurements. My opening is just under 10 feet wide at nine foot, nine and three quarter inches. So each door needs to be four foot, 11 inches to just barely cover the opening. Obviously, it needs to be wider than that, but not so wide that it covers the 2x6s on the sides. So I decided to make each door 5 foot 3 inches wide. When completely open, the doors will stick out past the building by an inch or two, but that is totally cool with me. I want to be able to remove the door for whatever reason without disassembling the cover at all. So I need to leave enough room after the track to let the trolley drop and be put back in. As a side note, I had a rough idea of the vertical measurements of the door, but didn't figure out those exact measurements until after hanging the rail. The design is set, so let's start mapping it out in actual space. I started by finding the dead center of the opening and marked its location. I also measured down from the top of the board to mark the spot of where the bolt will go. Then, I found the locations of the end brackets by measuring from the ends of the beam. These three spots will be important for when I actually hang the rail on the wall. Before doing anything else, I pre-drilled the holes a few inches deep. The building is white, but the trim for the barn door is going to be black. I want some sharp contrast for the look of the door. It's going to be difficult to paint everything after it's constructed because of all the nooks and crannies. So you'll see that I painted this in stages. First is to paint the beam. I decided to brush it instead of rolling because there's a few knot holes that a roller couldn't handle. Because it's outside and there was a slight breeze, the paint dried really quickly. So much so that I didn't have to wait to put on the second coat. Like a typewriter, I went right back to the beginning after finishing the first line. Okay, once the paint dried, I pulled off the masking and just barely attached the three brackets. I did this so I could measure the span from the center to the edges. I took a bunch of measurements during the design stage, but just wanted to double check that I was still on the right track. I cut the rails to the right size. I thought I had bought 10 foot track, but turns out I bought 12 foot track. So I guess I'll have a few feet left over for something else down the road, who knows. Next, I figured out the locations of the brackets. They need to be spaced evenly and at least every two feet. With one at either end, I used a measurement calculator to figure out the spacing. It came out to about 1 foot 10 inches between each bracket. I marked those spots with a sharpie so I can easily see them later. 
A few of the hanging brackets have set screws to keep the track in place, but for some reason they didn't fit on the track, or at least I couldn't get them on. So I used a grinding disc on a Dremel to shave off the inside threads. Then those set screw brackets slid right on. These are the key brackets at the middle and ends of the track. Those set screws are meant to clamp down on the track to keep it from moving. Let's put the track on. I put all the brackets on the rail and hand tightened the set screws on the ends so they wouldn't slide off. There's a metal piece that sticks into the end of the track to keep the door from going past the center. I forgot to put that in ahead of time. No big deal, it just hammers in. I attached one bracket and put the lag bolt in about three quarters of the way. Not ready to cinch it down the entire way yet. I brought up the other side and did the same thing. These lag bolts were going into the already pre-drilled holes. I adjusted the track a bit so it shared the center. I brought out the other track and started with the outside bracket first because its center bracket was already up on the wall. I used a clamp to keep the other brackets from sliding off. I forgot to put the center stopper in again. <laughs> it's always something. Next, I spaced out the brackets and took a step back to see it as a whole. I'd say it all looked good, so I got to work attaching all the brackets. I marked a hole, pre-drilled, and drove in the bolt. Just like before, I didn't tighten the bolt all the way. I still need to be able to slide the brackets back and forth a bit. The brackets came with a small bolt about two or two and a half inches long, but I upgraded to five and a half inch galvanized lag bolts. These things will really hold the weight and reach in far enough to grab the blocking behind the wall as well as the beam over the doorway. Once I got all the brackets semi-attached, I went back and cinched down every bolt. This track is supposed to be able to handle 450 pounds for each 10 foot section. I'm nowhere near that. And when I hopped up to give it a basic stress test, it didn't even budge. For the moment, it doubled as a very unique workout bar. <laughs> Next thing to work on was the track cover. There weren't a bunch of examples of how to build this, so I had to pretty much create my own design and hope that it worked. In the end, I think it turned out really well. I angled the saw to 20 degrees and ripped a few sample pieces. I brought those pieces up to the rail and did a test fit. Everything looked good and would fit well with how they were cut. Though when I was up there, I realized I forgot to tighten down the set screws on the track rail. So I went ahead and did that. Then I started ripping the two x four support beams. I made cuts so I'd have two eight foot pieces and one 10 foot piece. These have to sit on the brackets. So the spot where two boards meet will be at the center of a bracket. I started with the sides. I brought the far right edge three quarters of an inch from the edge of the black beam to allow for a side piece to go on the cover. The set screws stick up higher than the bracket. So I marked and notched out that spot. Then, I shifted over and made a mark where it lined up with the center of the furthest bracket. I did the same process with the 8 foot piece on the other side. Then, for the middle piece, I cut notches for the two set screws in the middle and marked the center of the brackets where it would meet up with the other boards. I made the cuts that I had marked, then painted the boards with two coats of black. I found it much easier to paint as much as I could ahead of time rather than painting 10 feet up in the air on a ladder. Much of these pieces would not be accessible to paint after they were installed anyway, so much better to paint before. While those were drying, I started working on the top cover. Both sides of these needed to be ripped to 20 degrees, so I cut one side of all three boards first, then adjusted the fence to cut the other side of all three. These boards got two coats of paint as well. When the paint was dry, I installed the support beam. The only contact here is wood to metal. So I figured the best way to attach these two is with construction adhesive. I used three times premium Loctite. This stuff will hold up in the elements longer than the wood will. I put it on any place where the wood will contact the metal. I brought the wood up and shifted it to the right place. Then I clamped it down at every bracket, every place where there was construction adhesive. I worked my way down the row, putting on all three pieces. I had just enough clamps to put one on every bracket. 
When the adhesive was cured, I moved on to the top face. I marked the center of the 10 foot board and brought it up, centered it over the doorway and screwed it in. Since the middle support piece was cut down to less than 10 feet, this top piece will overlap the seam on the supporting pieces. I also purposely used a 10 foot long piece for the center here so there would not be a top seam over the doorway. I popped a screw in at every foot. Then I drove screws in at an angle to connect it to the wall. I used a pre-drill to avoid splitting the wood. I also had to get the screw head at or just below the surface because of the flashing that will come later. The outside pieces had to be trimmed down to meet up with the edge of the back wall. They were attached the same way. I may have hammed up the pin a bit. There was a bit of extra gloop at the edges where the next piece would attach. So I used a drywall knife to get rid of any paint bumps and remove the excess. The next piece attaches to the underside of the top piece. So one edge needs to be ripped to 20 degrees. The other edge needs to be cut flat. In order to know how big to make it, I brought my sample piece to the underside and marked it at the same height as the doorway. Then I ripped the pieces to the right size. Just like everything else, these got painted on the ground. These guys were ready to go up. This is a big piece to hang up alone. So I put a clamp on the corner to hold the far end and prepped a few screws partway in the wood. I glued the surface that would attach to the top piece. At this point, I realized I forgot to glue the other pieces like I had planned, but they were screwed down so well that they would never be an issue. When I brought up the piece, the clamp gave way because there was enough clamping surface to hold the weight. I had wet glue on the edge, so I had to come up with a new solution quick. I brought over a second ladder, leaned it up, and attached the clamp to it. That gave me enough support to hold the far end of the piece while I attached the center. I had prepped a small nail, so I popped that in to help hold it in the right place while I drove in a screw. I moved around and drove in some nails and screws to really press that glue into the seam. Eventually, I made my way to the far end and relieved the clamp and ladder of their duties. At some point, I realized that the nails were pointless and the screws were doing all the work. So I just kept adding screws wherever I felt was needed. I wiped any of the wood glue that squeezed out of the seam. For the second board, I made sure that the center seam was as tight as could be. I used two 10 foot long boards for this front face to overlap the seams of the top face. I was really careful to drive screws into the center of the board so a screw didn't stick out of the front or back. This front face is the least supported of the entire cover. So to prevent any separation at the center seam, I put a backer board behind it and screwed it in from the front. It was a leftover cutoff piece from the top face so it was already painted black. It's probably about two feet long or so. I left these pieces long so I could get the seam right in the center. I marked the ends with a speed square and cut them flush with a circular saw. Next is the flashing. The flashing I got is 110 degree angle flashing, which determined the angle of the cover. One side is gonna tuck under the existing flashing but has to be trimmed to fit. I made a few marks to try and get as much overlap as possible, but realized I could just cut all the flashing the same and it would work fine. I used a small saw with a metal cutting disc to cut down one side. I went through several discs. This galvanized flashing is pretty tough. When the pieces were cut, they could be put in place. I can't lift up the existing flashing because that could bend the metal and negate how it's supposed to function. So I pushed the flashing in from the sides. I had to be careful not to put a bend in the piece as it went in. At one point it got stuck, probably on a glob of paint. I jimmied it a bit and got us to keep going. I realized there was still a barcode sticker on it. A razor blade wouldn't take it off completely, but Goo Gone finished the job. The other 10 foot piece of flashing overlapped the first piece of flashing by quite a bit, making it function even better. 
As it was, the flashing was not secured in any way, just a small friction fit. So I went through and put in flat-headed roofing nails every so often to lay the front edge of the flashing down as much as possible. Any place where it visibly rose up, I popped in a nail. The nails were only half an inch, so I had to use pliers to hold them so I wouldn't smash my fingers. I don't want this wood to get weathered, so the next step was to caulk everything. I caulked the screws in the wood, the nails in the flashing, the seam at the top, any open wood knot. I was very thorough. I used a black exterior sealant, so it already blended in, and then used a putty knife to smooth out the surface. About an hour later, when the caulk was able to be painted, I got to work putting two and a half coats on the exposed surface of the cover, painting over the flashing, caulking, and any scuffs that the wood suffered during installation. And that's just about it for the cover. The only thing left to do is put on the sides, but that won't happen for a little while. Time to build the doors. I already know my door width, five foot three inches. Now that the track is in, I can get an exact measurement for the height of the door. I mocked up a sliver of the door just so I'd have something hanging low enough. I put the trolley on the track and marked where the bottom of the door should be. The driveway will have a gradual slope down and start just a bit below the lip of the foundation. I brought my test piece to both sides to make sure that both doors should have the same measurements. They were pretty much equal. I took a few different measurements to reference later on while installing the hardware. The doors will be nine foot, one and a half inches tall. I did a bunch of research on barn doors and ultimately decided on a fairly simple design. It'll be three layers. The middle layer, which is the body of the door, will be one by six tongue and groove boards. Then there will be a trim layer of one by six on the front and back to act as a skeleton support structure. I laid out the boards on the ground to get a rough feel for the size of the door. It's big. I also did this to make sure I had enough material for two doors, which I didn't. I needed a little bit more of everything. For the purpose of this build, I'm assuming my workshop floor is mostly perfectly flat, but making slight adjustments for the spots I can tell are just a bit off. First thing was to lay down some 2x4s to raise everything slightly off the ground. I started putting together the TNG boards. I put glue in the grooves to help hold it together and make a good seal. I pressed each board into its neighbor and popped a screw at either end. If a board was being temperamental, I used a rubber mallet to tap it into place. If a board had a slight bow or bend to it, often the next board would help correct the issue. The thing I was most worried about while building the stores is to make sure they were square. They could look great laying on the ground, but if they weren't square and I put them on the track, oh boy, would you know. Through this process, I was mostly just hoping and praying that my methods would make it square and not a skewed parallelogram. I used a large T-square to mark a perpendicular line. I did it from both sides to make sure it was a good line. I brought in the first piece of trim, lined it up with the marked line, clamped it down, and started screwing it in. I put two screws through every board in a zigzag pattern. This will help fix any twist in the trim piece, though I was really particular when picking out this lumber, so it was already pretty good to start with. I measured and marked the height of the door from the top of the trim piece. I re-measured a few times just to be safe before clamping and screwing the trim piece in the bottom. It was at this point that I realized I was supposed to put down 13 tongue and groove boards. I only put down 12. I didn't want to unscrew the trim piece, so I just added it to the side with overhang. Now, I need to add in the long side pieces of trim, but it needs to have symmetry with the TNG boards below it. I'm putting a 3 quarter inch piece of trim on either side of the door, so I found the edges with that in mind to use as my marker for the edge of the trim. I cut boards to length for both sides and screwed them into place. I didn't follow the zigzag pattern here 
but rather just made sure they were evenly spaced. Next, I found the center of the door, measuring from the top and bottom, and installed a trim piece across the center with a zigzag pattern. I had been toying around with a few different door designs, but ultimately decided on this very simple design with clean diagonals. I was very particular to get the center of the board to meet up with the corner. A few times, I had to trim the board to get it to fit. I was really trying for a snug fit everywhere with minimal gaps. When screwing these diagonals in, I did a variation of the zigzag pattern, making sure each TNG board got two screws. The top and middle layers were complete, so now I needed to trim the fat before flipping it over and working on the back side. I used a speed square to make some marks and a circular saw to cut the edges flush with the trim. With the corners cut to size, I could check to see how square it was. I measured corner to corner, and it was perfect. Looks good. This is the front side, the side that will be exposed to the elements. So before flipping it over, I gave it a good vacuuming and filled in any gaps with wood filler. Most of them were along the board edges, but there were a few knots in the center of the boards as well. This thing already had a bit of weight to it. By no means impossible to move around, but definitely could squish a few things. I supported it well like before, and then got to work on the backside trim. The back has everything except the diagonals. I didn't have to measure this time because the edges were already determined by the cuts. The TNG boards definitely have a finished side and an unfinished side. I made sure the finished side was facing out but to cover the back side and give the door some more weight, I decided to add some half inch plywood left over from my walls. It would lay below the trim so it wouldn't ever be in the way. At first, I thought about using full sheets to fill in the squares, but I didn't have enough. So I scrounged some long half sheets to fill the voids. I made cuts wherever necessary to make them fit. I had to use short screws so they didn't pop through the front and only put screws at the four corners of each piece. There's only a few things left to do for this door. First off is caulk all the screw heads. I used exterior rated screws, but don't want the screws visible when looking at the door. So the caulk smooths the surface. I also put the side edge trim on. This covers up the edges of the three layers on the side. I had to rip a few strips to fit nicely. Before putting the edge on, I had to clean up just a little bit with a jigsaw. I used a clamp as I worked my way down to keep the edges flush. And just like that, one door is done. I got door number one out of the way, so I'd have room to build number two. I followed the exact same steps for this next door, but it went much quicker because I had it all figured out. At least, I like to think so. Before painting, I needed to smooth out the wood filler. I sanded down any of the spots, then vacuumed it clean. Painting took quite a while, especially on this front side. There's a ton of crevices to fill, 
I started with a solid coat of white on everything. I was very thorough getting paint in each seam. That's why I used a brush instead of a roller. After all, the paint is the first line of defense to protect the door for all of eternity. So, you know, got to do it right. After the first coat dried, I gave a second coat on the tongue and groove boards, being just as thorough this time. Some areas even got a third coat if needed. I didn't put a second coat of white on the trim because they're gonna be painted black. I taped up the edges around the trim to preserve what was already painted. It was kind of tricky getting the tape right in the corners because it's such a small space. But eventually, I got everything taped up properly. So I got to work painting the trim. Just like before, I was very thorough with the paint, making sure I got good coverage. I painted in long sweeping strokes along the grain to make the paint look as clean as possible. I also made sure to get enough coverage in the corners, but not glop it in there. With the first coat of paint on the trim, these doors were really starting to get some character. I think they look really good. Part of the hardware for the trolley will be visible below the track cover, so I put a few coats of paint on these as well. This is purely an aesthetic choice. The trim got a second coat of paint, and in some spots, a third touch-up coat, mostly just to hide any brush strokes. When the paint had dried, I flipped the doors over to paint the backside. I started with the brush and painted just the seam between the plywood and the trim. Then I went through and rolled everything else. The bulk of it is a smooth surface, so it just made sense to roll it instead of brushing it. I was gentle with the roller around the edge so as not to get any drips or splatter on the sides. The backside got a couple of coats. These doors were heavy. I wasn't sure how heavy, but I wanted to find out, and kind of also needed to know that I wasn't going above the limits of the hardware. I propped up one end and put a scale on the other end. According to this scale, I weigh 145, and that's in pounds, not kilograms. When I picked up the other end of the door, the scale jumped up about 90 to 100 pounds more. I figured that I was holding half the weight, so double that, and these doors are about 200 pounds each. With some hardware, it'll end up a little bit heavier, but nowhere near the 450 pound limit for each door. Now that the painting was complete, I could take off all the masking tape. Even though there wasn't much tape, with it gone, these doors were looking really good. Time to put on the trolleys. I guess the official name for these are hangers, but I like trolley. Since my track doesn't go all the way to the end of the building, I have to figure out where to put the outside trolley to allow the door to open completely. I measured from the edge of the opening to the far end of the track. I transferred that measurement to the top of the door. This mark is the limit of where the wheels of the trolley can be. If the wheels were any further to the left, the door wouldn't open all the way. I also measured and marked the vertical location of the trolley based on the measurements I took earlier. Before attaching the outside trolley, I worked on the one on the inside. I took some time making sure it was in the right place and square, then marked the locations of the three holes. I punched holes all the way through based on the size of the bolt. The carriage bolts that came with the trolleys were not long enough to work with this door, so I picked up galvanized carriage bolts and nuts that would work. I tightened them down so the bolt head on the backside was almost flush with the wood. I attached the wheels of the trolley, and just like that, one was done. I repeated the process three times more, making sure everything was even, clean, and in the right spot. The doors were now ready to go up, though I had a few things to do to prep for the installation. On the right side, I had to clear out part of the dirt pile to make room for the door. I cleared some of the other obstacles out of the way, and on the left side, put some blocks down to be able to stand the door up straight. It had rained the night before, so the dirt out there was a bit muddy. I wrapped the bottom of the doors in plastic to keep them from getting dirty. There was absolutely no way I'd be able to get the doors on alone, so my dad came down to help. We brought the first door just beyond the track and stood it up. The wheels on the trolley were askewed, so I used a pole to rotate them. The doors are awkward and 
heavy. So it took a few tries to get the first set of wheels on the track. I wasn't picking up the door high enough and needed to lift from the bottom. Also, my feet were slipping in the mud, which didn't help. But, here we go. It's in? My side's in. Right. Once the first side was on, we could work together to easily put on the other side. Now that the door was on, I could see if all that work actually worked. The door fit almost too well. It was quite snug against the building. It may rub a bit, but as my dad put it, I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. Because actually it's kind of good because it seals. Yeah. When the door is locked against the door frame, it'll prevent any air transfer, heat loss, etc., etc. That looks cool. Before we get ahead of ourselves, I put the stopper on the end of the track to keep the wheels from rolling right off. It would be like forgetting to engage the parking brake and the car rolling down the hill on its own. That would be bad. We set up for the second door by moving some blocks over and a thin piece of wood to rest the door on. There wasn't enough room for the door on the dirt, so we carried the door out to that leftover section of concrete slab. Just like before, the trolley wheels needed repositioning. Because the door had to tilt down, the first wheel went on pretty easily. Come on. Are you in? Yeah. The second wheel got a little stuck, but with a little nudge, it went on. The heavy lifting was over, but I was not out of the woods yet. I still needed to see how well the doors fit together. All right, now here's the real test. To see how, how nice the, how clean this is. Oh, dude. That's pretty good. Yeah. Oh, man, that's so cool. <laughs> take a picture. <laughs> it was perfect. Well, almost perfect. Oh, okay. That's a big one. Dude, that looks good. <laughs> I was most worried about the middle seam, that the doors would be out of square and there'd be a big gap at the top or bottom. But nope, the middle seam was perfect. The issue that I could see at the moment was the right door may have a little twist in it. When I installed the locking system, that may correct the issue. Also, my uncle, who is a very experienced woodworker, said that holding the doors in their ideal position will help fix the issue over time with muscle memory. I'm not even worried about that at all because these doors look so freaking good. Before I got too ahead of myself, I put the wheel stopper on the side. The doors open all the way and close all the way. They fit exactly as I designed them. There's plenty of overlap on the door frame. They fit snugly and slide easily. And to top it all off, they're stunning. Okay, time for some finishing touches. The framing around the doorway needs to get covered. But first, I had to clean up the wood. I pried off the spacers that were still there, as well as any nails. There were a bunch of staples in the frame to hold a plastic sheet during any rainstorms. So I just went through and hammered them flat. I picked up some wood that was a bit wider than the gap. I measured the space, cut the board to length, and screwed it in place. I followed suit for the other side and the top. Although, with the top, a small section of plywood overhung the frame, so I used a flush trim bit on the router to clean that up. 
I used a clamp as a partner to hold up the other side of the board while I screwed it in. I didn't trim the width ahead of time because I want this edge to be flush. While the walls are mostly straight, they're not completely straight. I first went through with a jigsaw to cut it pretty darn close, then made a final pass with the router to get that edge flush. I taped around the edges and painted this trim board white. This wood will kind of be exposed to the elements. Not fully, but enough, so it's important to keep them protected. Now comes the tricky part of figuring out how to keep the doors closed. I needed a way to keep the sides pressed shut, and for that, I found a cam action latch. The goal is to slightly pull the door into the wall to create a good seal. That'll keep air and water from coming through the sides, and it'll keep the doors from blowing around on a windy day. One thing I had to keep in mind is that anything I put on the door had to be flush mount. It can't protrude from the door or I avoid the concept of these snug fitting barn doors. So for the hook on the door, I got a spring loaded pole that's designed for a boat. Boats often have hardware that retracts back to avoid silly injuries. It works perfect for this situation. I installed a cam latch on both sides of the opening, one for each door. On the inside and the centers, I added some flush mount handle poles to be able to easily open the door. All that I had to do was use a router to cut out some rectangles for the handles to lay and attach them with screws from hidden holes inside the pockets. Where the two doors meet in the middle, I added some weather stripping to seal the seam when the doors are closed. I also picked out and installed some decorative but also functional handles for the outside of the door. There's one aspect of the latch system that I haven't figured out yet, and that's to press the two doors together in the middle. Whatever I do here has to be flush mount, but it also has to fix the bow of the doors. One door has a slight bow outwards and the other inwards, so the center latch has to bring them together snugly but also flatten them out and be flush mount. So, uh, <laughs> I'm stumped. Uh, but if you have an idea for a solution, let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I added a barrel latch to keep the doors flat in the center. This is purely temporary because it goes against the flush mount concept. Overall, I am ecstatic with how these doors turned out. They look fantastic and they work really well. I can keep them closed to have more of a studio feel, or I can open them up all the way and let in a bunch of natural light. Even with the gap at the bottom because the driveway isn't poured yet, there's very minimal sound getting through. Here's what it sounds like with the air compressor running on the inside and outside. I'm under a flight path for an airport. I was worried about the noise from planes flying over, but since putting the doors on, I haven't noticed them at all. What do you think? Are they good? Oh, yeah, they're good. Those doors are good. All right, one step closer to being done. Though this marks a big moment because now that I can lock up the workshop, I can finally start moving some tools in. And I have, and it's awesome. More on that soon. Okay, that's it for now. See ya. Say bye. Excuse me, that's not food. Uh-oh.
Hey, don't chew on that. That's not chew. That's not chew. Ew. Jeez. lot of aspects to making sure that these barn doors are just great. Oh, oh.